Things cannot stay as they are. It's ridiculous that we've ended up in this situation. Laura Mears Reynolds, podcast host and ADHD advocate. You can't make a one-size-fits-all model for anything. Look at what ADHD or however neurodivergence presents in you and really understanding that no two people with ADHD are the same. As a podcast host, you must have a lot of experience talking to people who are sharing their stories of emotional dysregulation. Yeah, absolutely. How do you see it showing up in relationships for, for people with ADHD? Do you know... And you said your ADHD diagnosis literally saved your life. Yes. What, what did you mean by that? I sat down on the sofa and I didn't get up for two years. And that was hard because when you can't understand why you are behaving a certain way and everyone is disappointed and everybody's angry, it's the most frightening thing. And so for me, now I know why, I don't have to hate myself. Mm. And that's really what the diagnosis gave me. Laura, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Big fan of the podcast. Likewise. Isn't this lovely? <laughs> I was watching your podcast and you've interviewed, you've done 100 episodes. Around about. I'm, I've got dyscalculia and I just can't keep track. But yeah, it's around about 100, yeah. Dyscalculia. Someone has explained to me that before. What's, what's, what's that? So like dyslexia, but numbers. Right, okay. Basically, in a nutshell. But it kind of... Um, it's, it's a really strange thing. I'm still kind of getting to grips with all the different aspects of the lovely little co-occurring cocktail of things that I've accumulated alongside ADHD. <laughs> and I'm not quite sure about it because it's like numbers dance around. But then the other side of it is that I also can't figure out the value of things as well. So it's not just like, is that... 150,000, 15,000, I can't put the number right, but then I also can't quantify it. But I don't know if that's part of dyscalculia or it might be dyspraxia or just keep throwing them in, whatever, yeah, yeah. you know. I another seem to one, have quite another, a few. <laughs> yeah, another label in the bag. Yeah, absolutely. You've done about 100 episodes, and I was curious to ask you what common themes you've noticed people with ADHD struggle with. Oh, that's such a good one. I think that there's always... Um, you have to sort of think of it a bit like a wrecking ball, right? Mm. So on the sort of day-to-day -day level, the wrecking ball can swing and take out like a, a meeting or you've missed the bus and you have to pay for a taxi or whatever it is. But then as you kind of go wider lens, particularly if the ADHD is unidentified, that wrecking ball can really take out so much. So I think the biggest one, it, well, it's everything from like, education, being at school, employment, all of these different things, relationships, and yeah, self-esteem is a big one. <laughs> Just keep swinging and see see what's taken out. Um, yeah, I think that answers. Do you know what? I always feel like I have to, I have to give like a, like a pre-warning to myself, right? <laughs> so I will forget what I'm talking about. I will absolutely go off on a tangent. I will I will take take this off the rails. So feel free <laughs> to tell me to be quiet at any point and remind me what we're actually talking about. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the low self-esteem is fascinating for yeah. me because I, I relate to that a lot. And lots of people I've spoken to say similar. And mm. for me, I think it comes down to like, the uh, it's related to masking, I find. Yeah. I, I, I sort of change who I am swap my personality to please whoever I'm with at the time. And therefore, if I don't really know who I am, it's quite hard to have any self-confidence if I don't know who myself is. Do you feel that you knew that about yourself before you identified that you had ADHD or this is something that you've come to learn? Should we save this for my podcast? <laughs> <laughs> no, we can do. No. I mean, it's definitely something that I've, I've way more aware of in the last year and a half since diagnosis. Yeah. Before, I was always aware that I changed who I was to match and fit in with who I was at any given moment mm. to the point where some people who know me well witnessed it and said Alex why are you, why are like you that? changing that's not who you are why are you speaking in that voice or why are you why? it's interesting isn't it because I think it's kind of well everything's complicated but obviously in different scenarios there is a different way to behave so you know you know that you probably shouldn't speak too loudly in a library for example, and if you can hold it in, then you would. And if my mother-in-law walked in this room, I would sit up straighter. Or mm. do you know, there's like different ways that you behave, but if you are literally changing who you are with a view to be accepted or this idea of, because it's always the perception, right? Nobody knows, but it's like this idea of what 
you think would be palatable to the audience. It's a really strange one. So like today, I um, I nearly didn't wear this today because I was like, well, everyone's going to think I'm a massive knob if they don't know why I'm wearing this. And, you know, all of that stuff. And then I was just like, I have to actually make sure that I don't do that. Like masking is a really tricky one. I think there's a lot that we can hold back to protect ourselves or there's ways that we're supposed to behave that actually I'm not that good at masking because I'm not very good at hiding what I think mm. on my face and not blurting stuff out. So <laughs> not brilliant. You look amazing, by the way. Today. <laughs> um, but yeah, I do, I do think it's super interesting. But you're right because obviously if you have no inherent definite sense of self, then it is going to definitely mean that you don't have much self-worth or your self-esteem will be low because it is determined on what other people think of you. Um, I always joke that I'm, I've always been 14. Like I've always been who I am and, mm. and kind of my priorities haven't shifted and the things that excite me haven't changed. I just kind of stayed that age, um, but I'm 41. So just flip it around. <laughs> Do you think masking in relationships can be quite damaging to the health of that relationship? Oh, gosh, 100%. Because how, you know, how can you properly connect to anybody if you're not showing up as yourself? Like, and I think it's quite funny. I remember long before I knew anything about ADHD, um, I was in a relationship and I used to say, oh God, like my own friends, like I wish they would go out more because I just, I just need a break. I just need a break. Mm. I just need to. And I remember a friend saying to me like, you need a break from what? Like this is your home. This is your relationship. Like what is it that you need a break from? And I didn't, I obviously didn't have the language, but that was it. Like I was, I was playing a role, um, trying to meet their expectations, trying to be accepted by them. And so, yeah, that's, that is exhausting. Mm. Like mentally and everything else, I did need a break. So, yeah. And I think, I think that ultimately everybody masks to a degree. And actually, you know, for the most part, I think that that would be about safety, about keeping ourselves safe, especially, you know, when you think about the whole, and I have always forget who said this, but the 20,000 negative comments, mm. uh, you know, in your, in childhood, neurodivergent children, hearing 20,000 more negative comments, then you've kind of got all of this, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like all of this evidence mm. that you're not good enough, you're not right, you're going to get it wrong, you know? It's it's all back there and easy to um, easy to access. I've forgotten what I'm talking about. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> and you don't need to cut it out because I'm all right with that. I don't mind. I don't cut these things out. I think it's important that we know that that's part of it. It's how it presents in me anyway. <laughs> I think it's fascinating. I wasn't going to go into masking today, but I think it's, it's super interesting. I think about my relationship with masking and it's really when I'm around a particular type of person. And yeah. for me, if I really reflect, it's someone who represents authority. Um, and that really snaps me back into, into someone how I into how I think I should behave, you know, very proper. I can't mess around when I'm with, and I don't know where that comes from, but is there a particular type of character, type of person that you think snaps you back into something? Do you know, it's really funny. It's other people's parents. And I always, you know, especially the age that I'm now, like it's quite common that people would be out with their parents. Oh, come to the pub. My parents are here. I'd be like, why would you do that? <laughs> like, I don't want, because I just, yeah, I feel like, um, I can't completely be myself or how, or I guess how I am is unacceptable and that I should be better behaved. And I think that there's so much in that, particularly when you think about gender, mm. the age that I am and the expectation on women to, you know, um, I mean, I wouldn't go as far as seen and, seen and not heard. I'm not that generation, but definitely to um, be a bit demure. Mm. And I, I've been called many things, but never that, actually, you know. <laughs> and you're married? I am, yeah. And your husband is neurotypical or? He's, he's ADHD AF yeah. as well, but he, um, he isn't diagnosed. He's self-diagnosed, mm. which is valid. Yeah. And it bloody well needs to be in this day and age. Mm. Um, but yeah, he's, he's definitely ADHD. But I think that's, that's the thing, isn't it? I, I've always joked in the podcast that... Um, 
Yeah, if you can stand my company for any long periods of time, I think it's highly unlikely that you are neurotypical. <laughs> <laughs> ADHD and a neurotypical, can they work in a relationship? It was a coach that said to me that what they saw time and time again was that ADHD and autistic partners are like magnets for each other. Mm, because what happens is, again, I'm generalizing and not speaking from experience and wish I could remember who's quote, <laughs> but basically that um, sometimes the balance can really work because let's just say, again, these are blatant stereotypes and not to fit for everybody at all. But if you say one partner was really confident and the other was really shy or in the different realms in which they could be that the other would prop the other one up one might balance the other out a bit yeah. and therefore they might maintain some regulation that might not otherwise be there if it was too say adhd is there might just be too much energy in the relationship well i guess that just completely depends doesn't it because obviously adhd can present so differently between individuals right so if you know, for example, in the community that I work in, the work that we do, people have different strengths, mm. right? So there are people that are so different to me, but we're part of the same community. And so I think it's it's never going to be exactly two of me. Mm. And I think that, you know, um, Ali, Matt Coaching, who I work with, like, we are quite similar. And sometimes when we're trying to get a project done, it might take a little bit longer or it might suddenly change track very quickly because mm. we have that same level of energy. We're so quick to change our minds and have all these ideas and explore things. But actually, sometimes we do need somebody else to rein us in. Mm. <laughs> but then we've got other people that are so brilliant at or that don't like to change the plan, that like all of the facts, that like the structure and to have everything laid out. So I think... It just depends. It's it's that diversity within neurodivergence mm. and really understanding that no two people with ADHD are the same at all. Yeah, no, it's very true. Yeah, are a lot. The, um, <laughs> the, the, yeah, the diversity within neurodiversity, you know, it's such an important point, isn't it? Um, and you, you've, met, you've met one person with ADHD and you really have just met one person. And, and that, Yeah, that's it. And that's why it's so important that we just have to be so careful with language because language isn't just powerful, it's very personal. Mm. You know, all of us, even no matter what we learn or what we see, we can only really speak from our own experience or our view of any given situation, which will be dictated from our own lived experience as well mm. as whatever else symptoms, society, where we're from, et cetera. So yeah, we have to be so careful not to generalize because I mean, a really good example is when um, I started the podcast, I was really, um, I noticed online that uh, some people had made some comments and, and the too much thing came up. She's too much. She's too much. And I remember just being like, are you kidding me? I've spent 30 however many years of my life feeling like I don't fit into society. I finally got the answer. I found a place and I'm here fighting for this cause. And actually, I don't fit here either. I just remember thinking that was outrageous. And it was like, well, actually, the idea of what neurodiversity or neurodivergence let me give an example sorry i'm rambling i'll get to the point so like events right so a neurodivergent friendly event mm. it doesn't actually exist i don't feel because when i came along to look at events everything was fidget toys for example fidget toys and quiet spaces and that is not my experience of of neurodivergence at all mm. I don't get overstimulated. I am understimulated most of the time. And actually to sit somewhere quiet for somebody like me who has auditory processing disorder, I'm hearing impaired, and I am, my brain is going a million miles an hour, if there's nothing going on around me, it actually makes me quite anxious. And you know, they're, they're, so you can't make a one size fits all model for anything. You have to just look at what ADHD or however neurodivergence presents in you. And I feel like I've used the wrong word there, but I might have done, I might not have done. Um, how your neurodivergence presents and what makes you feel comfortable and find your people, because that is what I did. I carved my own lane mm. because I realized that I am a lot and I am loud and some people have sensitivity to sound. 
some people um, process things in a slower way to the rambles that I, blah, 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 you know, that's okay. We just, as I feel the neurodivergent community, we have to be aware of how different this can be for everybody mm. and accept us all as one community without saying, well, that's wrong and that's right. And this is how this looks and this is how this feels because it's going to be completely different. I think particularly I was speaking to a couple of people earlier and they discovered their ADHD in their 20s. And their experience is entirely different to mine. Mm. You know, it's like I was talking about, um, well, the very dark stuff, which is, you know, one of the main reasons why I do what I do. And, you know, it, it, it wasn't really something that had really appeared on their radar at all. They were a bit like, oh, yeah, OK, I suppose that's a thing. And I was like, oh, no, it's definitely a thing. That's, that's what I'm doing. But it is. We're all going to experience it so differently. I'm sorry, I haven't come up for air for a really long time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, bet, I bet the comments, though, that were saying you were too much, I mean, that must, they were the minority, surely. There's only a couple of ha a handful of them. I mean, I'm a lot. Like, it is, you know, I, I do understand that people... If you, however your symptoms present, mm. it's the same as anything. Like what food you like, what music you like, or any, you know, you are going to be too much. I am too much for some people, but I felt that the insinuation that that was inappropriate for the neurodivergent community was where I had a problem is because, well, no, I definitely fit into that. Mm. That is my experience. And there are going to be people that experience it in a similar way. And actually all of those people are being shut out if we're talking about things being too loud, you know? So actually, there are loads of us. <laughs> As a podcast host, I mean, you must have a lot of uh, experience talking to people who are sharing their stories of emotional dysregulation. Yeah, absolutely. How do you see it showing up in relationships for, for people with ADHD? <sighs> do you know, The emotional side of ADHD is, is obviously, again, it's going to be different for everybody and it's very, very complex. And I think one of, the, one of the things that I find very interesting at the moment is there is a school of thought. There are people talking about rejection-sensitive dysphoria and it not necessarily being real and how it's just, like I said, those 20,000 things, all of those reserves of, of we're terrible people, et cetera. Um, sort of knocking the wind out of your sails mm. as you go and making you overly cautious to keep yourself safe or whatever. But I know that that has plagued my life since childhood. Like I can remember very specific times way before I would have necessarily built up any negative ideas about myself. So I know that m that's my experience of it anyway. But I think in relationships, obviously, if we have emotional dysregulation, if we have low self-worth, low self-esteem, or we are trying to play a role to be accepted, to be loved because we think we're unlovable, I think probably, you know, one of the most massive and, and detrimental ways it can present itself is that we're going to be mistrusting. So you're not going to trust, especially if you, if you feel unworthy of the person that you're with or whatever relationship it is in your life, then you're going to think that actually they don't like you. Mm. And then the RSD is going to tell you that they don't like you. And then that's going to live in there. And then you'll, you know, it's, it's a horrible, horrible thing. And I feel like for me, I've been really trying to think about how to sort of disempower RSD and how to identify that that's what it is. Because it feels so real, right? Mm. You can be like, oh, well, I think this thing, oh, no, that's definitely true. That's definitely what's happening. And so I've renamed it Really Shit Daydreams. Really shit daydreams. RSD is really yeah. shit daydreams. And then when you're thinking like, could this just be, oh yeah, because it's not real. Like, even if you do think that something is real, you don't have the proof that it's real. You're just imagining that it is. It's just a really shit daydream. Mm. So, yeah. Do you remember those really early ex memories of experiencing that reaction? Yeah. You mentioned before you had any uh, opportunity to be exposed to negative exactly. messages. It was always like this... Um, it's like a, like a feeling of you're about to be found out or that the people that you love don't really love you. There's something in it, right? Mm. And it's like, it doesn't matter 
how much evidence there is to the contrary. If you can feel, if you can physically feel it in your body, then it, um, yeah, it's 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 always been there. <laughs> it's always been there, and I think it's interesting because. You know, there's so many of us, and again, you know, I'm going to lean on gender, but that's only because that's the experience that I have, mm. right? But there's so many of us that would be labeled things like overly sensitive, cry baby, uh, a cry baby, or a warrior. Oh, you're a warrior. All of that kind of stuff. When actually, it's like part of this really big, enormous thing. You're like dragging this horse around with you day and night. It's not mm. like, oh, she's a bit sensitive. It's like this thing. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's hard for a neurotypical partner to understand the effect that RSD has on the person mm. in a relationship? I think that it's really difficult. I think that if you, if you're in whatever kind of relationship it is, whether it's like a romantic relationship or a family relationship or whatever, I think that sometimes how RSD can present, if you are feeling, because um, it's this perceived rejection rather than an actual real concrete thing, then if you're turning, and I know this has happened to me in the past, is if you're turning around and you're saying, you know, um, if you were to voice it or to show that you were jealous or concerned, then actually how offensive that can be. Like, you know, you're calling somebody's morality into question. You're saying, mm. I don't believe the words that you're saying. If you're telling the person that you love and that, lo and that loves you that you don't trust them, like that's a really awful thing because then they would be stood there questioning, well, what is this then? Mm. Why are you here if you, if you think I'm that kind of person? How do you think it shows up in your marriage, rejection, sensitivity, dysphoria? I was going to say I'm very lucky. I'm not very lucky. I've, I've worked <laughs> hard, you know, and taken brave, brave choices, made big risky decisions and um, in for a penny. But I think it's like more the past. I think that's the only thing that can really trip trip me up and that's a trap I've fallen down many times um because I guess if you're if you've got all the evidence to the contrary and everything's going well you'd be like oh my god this is great then what is there to RSD about mm. or did they prefer the person they were with before do they wish that they were so do you know like it's it's um if your brain is wired that way paired with emotional dysregulation, all of that evidence that we spoke about, and this low self-worth, et cetera, then obviously in a bid, we'll argue, to keep yourself safe, you're gonna try and find the reason for this feeling. Mm. And so even if the going is good, that's where you can fall down, I guess. But. For me, it's really, really complicated because I feel like my life is just com is, is two completely different things. It was up to the point of finding out that I had ADHD was one person mm. and this person is somebody else. And I, I can honestly say that I don't, there is, there, I'm, I'm not gonna sit here, oh my God, I feel like I need to touch wood or something. Oh my God, Laura, <laughs> stop, don't jinx yourself. But if, you know, there's nothing, I feel very, very strong in my relationship. I genuinely do, but I know that I didn't before. I fell down very, very hard. I fell down hard and I couldn't get back up. I kind of say all the time, my, my phrase is, I sat, sat down on the sofa and I didn't get up for two years. And that was hard because without the knowledge of why I was so stuck and what it was I was going through, the, without the language to convey that, I could see how that could look like you're not trying. Mm. You know, there's all those kind of memes or illustrations and it's like what people see and there's somebody just lying on the sofa scrolling on their phone and actually internally they're in absolute turmoil, like, you know, paralyzed in uh, task paralysis or choice paralysis or whatever it is. And yeah, I do remember that. I know in a previous relationship I had been um, criticized for not kind of doing enough or showing enough, I don't know, that I cared or gratitude or something. And um, I remember thinking, my gosh, you really can't see how hard I'm trying. And when you don't know what it is or why it is, is such a terrifying thing. And I say the word terrifying because I, I really do mean it. I've spoken a lot in the past, especially in the live shows 
I've given, you know, really personal life stories and a couple in particular, the, the real feeling, I, I really don't, it's so hard to convey because I don't like using this language, but it's the language that I had at the time is that I was, I'm trying, I wish I had a better word, but insane. I know that's an awful word to use and I, I apologize if that offends anybody. I just don't have the language, but when you can't understand why you are behaving a certain way, where you can't seem to do the thing that you want to do, mm. or every time you think you're getting to a place and you stumble and you fall back 10 steps, you know, and everyone is disappointed and everybody's angry. It's just like, why? <laughs> you don't know why. It's the most frightening thing. And so for me, now I know why. And I had such a fire lit under my ass from the injustice of, of it all. You know, it's a wonderful thing to finally know that I'm not the only person in the world that struggles in this way. But it isn't at the same time. Because I'm absolutely furious for all of them. Like, like, come on, guys, this is not all right. What are we doing about it, you know? I think it goes back to that low self-esteem issue because you don't know why, pre-diagnosis, pre-awareness, yeah. you don't know why you struggle and you can't get off the sofa. And that's what's going to eat into your yeah. self-confidence. Yeah, what is wrong with me? Why can't I show you that I'm trying? Why can't I? Why can everybody else hold down a job? Why is everyone else able to do these things? Why can... Why can't I manage a bank account? Why can't I drive? Why can't I, do you know, all of these things. And mm. it just, all this shame builds up. And it, yeah, it spirals. There is that thing, isn't there? It's like when you do find out that you have ADHD and you're picking apart, you know, what, what's you? What's your personality? What is ADHD? What are symptoms? But what are the, the what's the word I'm looking for? Like, the knock-on effects of a lifetime of not knowing mm. and that's that self-esteem absolutely yeah what have you learned about all of that and in particular rsd in relationships having spoken to so many people on your podcast gosh i've learned a lot every day is a school day i tell you but i think um i think one of the things that really keeps me up at night is how vulnerable we can all be and, and, you know, that, it makes me sad. There are a lot of people in really unhealthy relationships being really taken advantage of in a lot of different ways and either not being able to identify the red flags, see the patterns in behavior or without knowing, like subconsciously just accepting absolute can I swear? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolute bullshit. Because without knowing, they think that that's all they deserve or that they're lucky to have it and all of this stuff. And it's, it's yeah, it's really, really heartbreaking. And I think it's especially if people feel trapped in relationships because they are masking, perhaps even to themselves or keeping up appearances to their family or perhaps they're in a position where they're too afraid to not be in, in bad relationships. And I just, I see a lot of that. And I've learned that and that, that makes me really sad. But the good side of it is that in spaces like these, in having conversations like these, in creating different communities and spaces where we can come together, we can prop each other up and raise each other's worth and perhaps even mm. identify the red flags that people can't see staring them in the face and know that there is life on the other side, you know? It reminds me of a Ned Halliwell mm. quote that he said, "People, the ADHD brain is like having a Ferrari engine but having bicycle brakes. It's quite yeah. a famous quote now. And it reminds me of the thought that we can very easily and impulsively and quickly start things but we can we find it sometimes quite hard to stop things yeah. and i relate that to relationships i think thinking about my own experience and the people i've spoken to we can get into relationships very enthusiastically and very quickly but we can struggle to leave relationships even when we want to um, yeah. and that feeds into the people pleasing element a bit the fear of confrontation so i guess my question is do you have any advice for someone in that very particular situation where they're in a relationship it might not be great for them they want to get out of it but they don't know how run 
joking. I, I'm, I'm really always very reluctant to give advice. I don't know if it's my own imposter syndrome. I'm definitely not qualified to give anybody's advice, apart from the school of, school of hard knocks, school of life, all of that. But, you know, I think that the only advice that I would ever give anybody is that we have only got one life. And I think, you know, we're up against it, peeps. Mm. We've got faulty dopamine receptors. It's hard. It's hard. You have to cultivate the joy and you have to make the most of your time that you have. So if you're not, if you're struggling, if somebody makes you unhappy or makes you doubt yourself, then yeah, try and get out of it. But it is so easy to say, isn't it? Mm. It's so easy to say than when you're inside it because so often we can be in unhealthy relationships and not realize that we are because also that could be all we know from our parental, you know, our family relationships from everything. So mm. what do you think are like, what do you think are three signs of a failing relationship? Oh God, you know, like literally my impulsivity was lit. I was, dr I was just like wanted to scream something rude and I'm just not going to. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think one of the ones that I've really identified and is, and this is, you know, in the last couple of years, is how you feel when you come away from spending time with somebody. So there's, and I'm, I've lost the words already and I'm kicking myself because I know I know about this, but it's like, it's interoception and something. So often we can miss internal cues. So not just in terms of emotional cues, but like hunger, thirst, um, tiredness, whatever it is. So I think for many of us who are not in touch with our, emotions and our feelings and perhaps those warning signs you know before I started taking medication for ADHD I was anxious all of the time that I didn't even know I had anxiety mm. I just thought that was life you know so if we're so out of tune of, with how we feel inside our bodies the best one that I've noticed is when you come away from being in a situation with somebody do you feel lighter or do you feel heavier does that person make you want to lie down <laughs> <laughs> because if you feel heavier after you've walked away from somebody, that's a sign. I would say that's that's one of my one of my main ones that I stick to now is if somebody's draining or not. Because I think prior to the finding all this out and raising my own self worth bit by bit by bit, uh, not any kind of guru at all. Um, I would have just thought that, like you said, it's the people pleasing. And if any person had rejected me, that that would have been a massive failing. And look, you, you know, it is right. You are awful. And they found out and you've been mm. found out kind of a thing. But actually, you know, you have to feel good in somebody's company as well because your time is precious, actually. Um, you said three, didn't you? And I've only given you one and rambled. Let me <laughs> think about it. <laughs> I would interject, by the way, and say, because I think that it's like, like imposter syndrome. I think you are qualified to say this because you've had... 100 episodes I talking know. to people with ADHD. That what? probably makes you significantly more qualified than a lot of people who are calling themselves experts. Do you know what it is? Um, so actually, so season three is about to start. And uh, I do this whole thing at the beginning of every season. I'm not an expert. I'm not a therapist. not a coach. not a trainer. Even though I should go blah, blah, blah. And it's like, at some point, should I stop saying that? Do I stop saying that? I mean, I'm not trained. I'm still not emotionally equipped. But do I know what I'm talking about? What, what is expertise? I guess I do. I've spoken to enough people and that's not just in the podcast. That's like daily mm. in, the, in the community that I've built. But I think it's just, yeah, I think you're right. Actually, Alex, it is. It's imposter syndrome. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like, who would listen to Imposter me? Imposter syndrome in action on the podcast. Yeah, but just, you are, and you know, you know, you are. I don't, I don't like the word expert, uh, but I, you are I'm more allowed qualified. allowed to have an opinion at least, I know. You've spoken to over 100 people. And you've got first-hand experience from, and also the people you've spoken to on, at your shows, live shows, in the community. You've probably spoken to over a thousand people. You've got a breadth of knowledge in that head of yours. Yeah. And that's the thing, isn't it? Because, I mean, medically, they would call us experts by experience anyway. So we are still experts and there is value in it. And I just need to work on it. I think it's funny because I think a lot of what I've seen in, in like, particularly in the community, because we... You know, we wake up together some days doing body doubling, like meetups, things like that, is that we kind of, it can often, I hate generalizing, it can often be easier for us to fight for others than it can be for ourselves. And so I, I do, 
I'm sort of there rallying, rallying the troops, so to speak. And come on, guys, you can do this and you can do that. And then it's like, you can apply that to yourself mm. as well. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Don't worry about me. And I think, yeah, it's definitely something that I need to work on. Because you're going to love the next question if you don't like generalizations. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious to know because you're married. Yes. What does make a successful ADHD marriage? Fun. Yeah. Uh, do, do you know, it's, oh God, it's so difficult. Like, I, I, there's so much that I want to say and I just feel like I'm going to absolutely embarrass myself. And Mercury went retrograde today and I know I'm going to say something wrong. So I'm just like paranoid <laughs> to say something wrong. You just need people that light you up. And that's it. That's it. You know, we are up against it. Some days it's like Groundhog Day, isn't it? And, mm. you, you know, you wake up, it's like, oh God, here we are again. Especially, you know, for me, sorry to go there, but like, um, when I spoke to Dr. Nigat Arif on the podcast, she talked a lot about um, how all of our hormones can exacerbate our ADHD symptoms, right? So like yesterday, I was trying to edit the podcast and I sat there. It took me fucking hours. Like I was literally sitting there like, oh, why is this taking so long? Why is this taking so long? And my husband came in, he's like, He's like, what's wrong? What's wrong? I was like, I don't know, but <laughs> everything's really hard and I'm so tired and oh, I'm bleeding. It's my period. <laughs> and do you know what I mean? It's that. It's like we, we can't identify how we feel. We're up against it anyway. You've got hormones against it. You need people that light you up. You need to have fun. And my husband is really, really funny and he's really fit. I enjoy his <laughs> <laughs> and that's And that's it, you know. It has to actually be enjoyable because... We all know life is hard, right? Mm. Life is going to throw knocks at us left and right out of the blue and we're up against it. So you have to be with people that make you feel good in every in every sense, whether that's romantically or otherwise. So that's it. Do you find it hard? Do you think it's hard for an ADHD person to communicate that emotional dysregulation to somebody who doesn't get it? I think sometimes it's hard for us to to be able to communicate it to to anybody or to mm. understand it ourselves. There is a lot of irrational, um, reactionary stuff, isn't it? Especially, you know, I can I <laughs> like doing the live show. Sometimes I will be mid sentence and a cry just falls out of my face, like literally talking, and I'm <laughs> howling, you know, from nothing. So I think it's very, very hard to communicate when you when you can't even quite get to grips with it yourself. But I think, you know, part of what we're all doing here, right, is raising awareness. And a lot of awareness has been raised these last few years, which is fantastic. We just need acceptance to start moving at the same rate as the mm. awareness and we'll be away. But I don't know about you, like, I genuinely, genuinely in my heart, I believe, that this bullshit is not going to fly for much longer. Like, things cannot stay as they are. It's ridiculous that we've ended up in this situation. The times are changing, hopefully, in our lifetime. And we can look back at this and go, can you even believe that we had to do this? Because everyone will just understand it. It mm. will just be, a, oh, right, you've got ADHD. Okay, I know what that's yeah. about. You know, I, I do believe that that day will come. Yeah, it reminds me of, um, and I was researching this this morning, it was when they realised that loads of children were left-handed and at first they just thought it was a trend and they were trying to whack the left-handedness out of kids and yes. force them to use yeah. the other hand. Now, obviously, we know that left-handedness is incredibly common and it's absolutely normal. Yes. I think the same is going to happen with ADHD 100%. and all of these things. A hundred percent. It would just be great if, um, you know, the mainstream media could get on board. That would be wonderful. Mm. Um because you things you know it's, it's it gives me so much hope when you do read something relatively uh relatively positive in the press because for the longest time there it was like you'd see adhd in a headline and you just brace yourself you're like ah oh, here we go what's coming and it you know it really felt like an attack mm. um and they do have a responsibility you know adhd again i'm i'm going to go back to the language thing like People don't like the word disability, right? I don't mind. And people can view their ADHD, their neurodivergence, however they want to view it. That's absolutely fine. But we, it, ADHD is a, is a disability under the Equality Act 2010. And really, in terms of the mainstream media, like no other disabled group of people would get bashed and treated the way that we do. Like we're actually a protected group. And if you think about it, like often... 
the the attacks because they are attacks that come are as an actual result of our symptoms mm. and that is the very thing that we are protected from so i just think that society as a whole getting better they don't know that because most people are i i believe most people are good and they wouldn't go around being awful to people with disabilities mm. for their disabilities definitely you know so i think it's just a case of people eventually need to understand and learn that it is one and start behaving properly <laughs> stop stop stacking off disabled people in the first place. yeah yeah i agree i mean i think it's i think a lot of people don't get it because you can't see it a lot of the time you can't yeah. see the struggles and in fact a lot of us are incredibly good at looking and appearing normal and actually the internalized chaos and the dysregulation and the, and the chaos that's going on behind the scenes and the life falling apart behind the scenes and internal, like it's not visible to most people. So they don't associate that appearance with the word disability. Yes. Um, but no, 100%, of course, it's a disability. Once you, if you live with it and you can see the, 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 the effect it can have on you, um, you know, behind the scenes, but also in front as well, um, untreated, unmanaged, it can be catastrophic. Absolutely. It just unidentified. And that's the thing, isn't it? It's like, yeah. When you know why, it, it changes everything. It reframes everything. Mm. So, Laura, I ask all my guests for an item that most that represents ADHD in their life, and yours was a kitchen ladle. So I'm going to intriguingly ask you what a, a kitchen ladle means to you. So this kitchen ladle. So this isn't the kitchen ladle. There is the there is an, an actual kitchen ladle, which is the one. But this will suffice for now. Thank you very much. So. Um, <laughs> Basically, um, I'm a very all or nothing person mm. and it kind of transcends into every area of my life. I feel so much better now I'm holding. <laughs> yeah, you got the it's power like, now. Yeah. This, is my, this is my comfort zone. So um, I was interviewing a wonderful guest called Joe and he suggested that we do a tour, right? But he only meant let's go for beers. He meant come to Manchester and let's go out. But I'm like, tour? Yeah, let's go on tour. Let's do that. So created this ridiculous tour called the too much tour because I had a bee in my bonnet about the too much comment right so did this tour went to oh god I can't even remember 16 cities in the UK pretty much back to back like it was outrageous it's the most ridiculous thing ever um but part of it was that the live shows they are a seminar and I think again that self-worth imposter syndrome stuff um, made me feel like that's not something that I could do. Mm. So I lent into the parts of my life that I do feel comfortable. I've always been a festival trader, put on events in Ibiza, things like that. So I can do things in a fun way. So the seminar became bingo. And I, uh, my skirt was too short to pull the balls out of the thing. So I was like, what can I use? Oh, I see. So, the ladle. Ladle. Yeah. so this bad boy, I'd mm. pick up my ball. I'd read out what it was and I'd read my category Genius. to, to give the seminar. And in doing so, it basically is so, it, it's sort of symbolic across the board because, like I said, I sat down on the sofa and I didn't get up off it for mm. two years. This is me coming out of the kitchen. It's my actual kitchen ladle from my house. I got out of my house, off the sofa, yeah. and I went all around the UK. And also, it, it not only supports the fun element of it, it not only supported the way that ADHD presents in me and if ADHD presents in the people, well, if you listen to the podcast then it's going to be mm. kind of similar. Um, in It's supportive in learning. So it's kind of all symbolic of, would you just go and sit at a seminar? To be honest with you, I wouldn't. Mm. I'd find it really boring, but I would go and play bingo, especially if you told me to wear left print and that there was going to be karaoke. Now, within that, if our brains work better to a reward system, then you're more likely to pay attention to the category because you might win a prize, right? So we play the game and round we go. And it also meant for me that every single show is different because the balls are going to come out in a different order. That means I don't get bored. So no two shows are the same. So this is just like, it symbolizes, what is it? it? It symbolizes not just how ADHD presents in me, it's really in me bringing joy mm. into raising ADHD awareness, which has also supported what has been a really dark and difficult time. Mm. Because not only did I have all of the awful life imploding stuff and feeling basically 
definitely, well, I am lucky to be here. That's the truth of it. But also it's, um, it's like I said, in reliving the same story again and again, because everybody, this is how we relate, right? If I tell you a story, you're going to tell me one back mm. so that I'll understand that you get it, right? So everybody who's listened to the podcast wants to tell me their story. Now, if their story is similar mm. to mine, then I'm reliving the trauma again and again and again. But with this which I literally wave around and I make us sing songs into, it means that I get to connect with all of these people, mm. but we also get to have some fun. So even though we can sit in this sad and difficult space, we can also enjoy ourselves because that's what we all need with those faulty dopamine receptors. And it's just ridiculous now. And I just love it. Like literally I stand on, like I think the last show I stood on stage with it, I didn't need it at all. I just held it for the whole thing because it has become like a support <laughs> object. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. And you're right, you know, it symbolizes what you just said, but it also symbolizes the transition between yeah. your recovery, I suppose. And yeah. I don't know if you're happy to talk about this. Yeah, um, completely. I'm totally happy. I mean, yeah. You, you, I saw a post and you said your ADHD diagnosis literally saved your life. Yes. What, what did you mean by that? So it's really, really complex, but I'll try. I'll try and get there. So um, on ADHDF, one of the questions that I always ask everybody is what has undiagnosed, I want to change it now because I, I don't want it to be so diagnosis is so important, but self-diagnosis is valid. But what has undiagnosed ADHD cost you? And the reason I ask that question is because it quite literally has cost me everything. So I, you know, I have not just lost friendships, relationships, it's impacted my family, it's impacted my mental health, not just my bank balance on that. Oh, look, ADHD tax. I mean, like, I have been broke. <laughs> like, you know, I, uh, it has literally cost me absolutely everything to the point that there was really nothing left of me. And truthfully, and this is where it feels uncomfortable because uh, I fear the judgment of what anybody could say to this, but, you know, I gave up on me. And really, the only reason why I am still here or why I persevered was because I loved my husband, really truthfully. Um, I just feel too guilty to have left him. Mm. And so I sort of, I persevered. And, um, but yeah, it was December 2022, 2021. Yes, 2021. Um, I just, yeah, uh, I lost a friend, my best friend, um, passed away. And I've lost quite a few friends along the way um, to what I can identify as um, the impact of a, unidentified ADHD. You know, um, statistically speaking, I hate pulling out the statistics because obviously I've got dyscalculia. But as I recall, um, one in four ADHD women has made an attempt on their life mm. and we're five times more likely to um, take our own lives. Um, and, you know, you've got accidental or premature death because of risk taking, because of not being able to take care of ourselves or the rest of it. And um, when I lost yet another friend prematurely, I, the, it just didn't sit right with me at all. I mean, obviously, but with my own emotional dysregulation, with my justice sensitivity, it wasn't just that I couldn't control my emotions. I was outraged by how wrong that was. And I was completely plagued by um, survivor's guilt, basically. So I, I, I wanted to swap places with them. I didn't think it was fair because to my mind, I could look at their life and say, well, they've got all this ahead of them and all of this opportunity. Whereas I mess things up and I'm always going to mess things up and everything, no, nothing is ever going to be all right. So why have I still got this life and they haven't got theirs? Um, so I was kind of stuck in just this really, really awful place. And yeah, it really was only that, yeah, not wanting to be the ultimate letdown and mm -hmm. break my husband's heart that that kept me here. And I kind of remember it so clearly at that time. It was it was literally weeks before my ADHD assessment. And I remember just thinking, go on then, one more go. Like just pick yourself up and 
it's it was a real real fight to keep my head up or see the point in in really anything but um I just figured if I'm going out anywhere I might as well go out with a bang sorry that's a horrible thing to say but that's really how I thought about it I was just like right then if I'm doing it let's do it roll the dice let's go and just really focused on it's such a again I'm so nervous of saying the wrong thing I can't edit this out <laughs> but it's like um it's kind of like I, I wanted to I didn't want to be around anymore but the fact that I could potentially see that I was making a choice not to there was some power in that but there was also safety in that so then I could be like well you might as well just give this podcasting thing a bash you might as well just go and do this because you could always just it doesn't work out awful thing to say but that that did prop me up for a little while there as I was finding out as I was getting my diagnosis as I was getting support as I was trying to raise my self-worth and trying to find myself and the purpose of even being here (laughs) um I I yeah I lent on that crutch very hard Mm. And it's really funny because when I got diagnosed, and again, that imposter syndrome, and I see it all the time, you know, people think to themselves, well, um, I must have hammed that up. I must have convinced that person, that that psychiatrist, that I've, that I've got it because I definitely don't have it. I'm just a terrible person, right? And all of that. And I, and I woke up the morning after getting diagnosed and I remember thinking just the fog seeping in as it did every morning and the heaviness and oh god silly kind of a thing and then I just thought to myself oh I I just had this little glimmer of hope of just like well actually I don't have to hate myself Mm. I don't have to I don't have to hold all of this shit anymore (laughs) because it's not real and it's not necessarily been my fault and I can bit by bit by bit. And that's really what the diagnosis gave me. It gave me this tiny little glimmer of hope that bit by bit, day by day, I could just hate myself a little bit less. And step by step by step by step by step. And yeah, so it, it did literally save my life, you know. The, and the medication, you know, it's, it's such a difficult thing to talk about at the moment in medication shortages. Like so many of people cannot access medication and so many people don't want to take medication or they can't because they've got other Mm. medical ailments or whatever. But for me, you know, like I said, I really didn't know that I was literally popped out anxious. It was just my reality. And it wasn't until I took ADHD medication that I was like, oh, that that constant Mm. buzzing feeling of absolute dread, doom and fear. Where is it? It's just, you know. It's, it's a gone. heartbreaking story, but I think it also shines a light on how important it is to raise that awareness. Because like you said, one in four women go through that. I mean, how, how your husband, when he hears you sh- share that story, how do you think he feels? Honestly, I don't know why he stuck around. <laughs> I don't know how he puts up with me at all. I don't know how he must have felt. It must have been awful. It must have been mm. dreadful. It must have been so traumatic for him. But... He is, as I said, he's he's the joy and he's the light. And mm. even in those dark times, he made me laugh, you know, <laughs> and that's it. But, you know, for me, I know, as ever, I can only speak for myself. But in speaking for myself, I've met many others that are similar to me. And all I want, I'm not saying everyone should be medicated. And I scream it from the rafters all the time. Self-diagnosis is valid. Not everybody needs to have a diagnosis. Mm. Not everybody needs to be on medication. But my God, I will fight for the rest of my days for everyone to be able to have that opportunity. Mm. Because for anybody who felt like me, I am, it's, it's, it's night and day. Mm. I'm a completely different person. And I'm literally only here because of it. Genuinely. Yeah. I mean, it's heavy, it's, isn't it? Sorry, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, gosh, you and I sort of, uh, yeah, that's, that's yes, yeah, amazing story. Thank you. I'm sorry it's so dark, but that's no, the no, reality of it. And the mm. thing is, you know, all of this stuff, the fun that I have, the way that I'm dressed, you know, the leopard print thing is, is, is really silly, but it makes me happy. And in this place with so much darkness and what I'm fighting for, you know, like 
literally here avenging dead friends. Like, that's a ridiculous story. I'm a ridiculous person. And you have to kind of try and see the funny side of it. There isn't one, but I'll make one mm. because I haven't come here <laughs> to just fight and be angry and be sad. Mm. There has to be joy. And the joy is in this community. And the joy is in seeing change happen and, and uniting and... You know, the, as I said, the leopard is a symbol of Aberdeen. Mm. It also symbolizes bravery and the reclaiming of power. And I'm just an absolute hun. <laughs> so I just really like wearing leopard print. I've managed to get loads of other people to do it with me. And it's great. You look fantastic. <laughs> I love the outfit. <laughs> We're going to do the washing machine of woes, Laura. Every week Get I ask out. my Instagram community to send in their in woes. <laughs> just to give you a twirl. <laughs> um, and let's see what their woe is this week. Um, I think you mentioned the... ADHD tax. I did have a sneak peek at this earlier. Okay, here we go. This week, someone said, ADHD is expensive because I forget about my parking fines, which means they double. I buy stuff for new hobbies and then lose interest and throw away bits of moldy food. Curious to know if you fall victim to the ADHD tax. And if so, any tips to avoid it? Oh, I have no tips here. No, no. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely not one. I Should we just embrace the ADHD tax? No, I just, I'm skin. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's terrible. I think that, um, no. I mean, my life has got a lot better since having banking apps that are actually telling you the truth mm. rather than that lying lady that I used to ring up who just made up numbers that didn't exist, right? It is, it is you know, to be able to see how much money you've got and to be able to keep track of all the little things because the little things add up to the big things, isn't it? A can of Coke here, a magazine there, a bus fare, next thing you know, absolutely broke. But in terms of tax, no, I pay it left and right all the time. So I was supposed to fly here today from Edinburgh and I ended up flying from Aberdeen because I gave myself too much work to do and there was no way I could get there last night. Mm. So I had to buy a completely new flight, you know, nonsense like that. So, I mean, I don't drive. I couldn't manage any of that, to be honest with you. Tax, remembering what dates. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't do any of it. Like, no. But it's nice to know that we're not alone because that, no, that helps to that. remove some How of the shame. With it? Um, oh, awful. Yeah, no, I have to. <laughs> I, my hack is now I buy frozen vegetables, frozen pre chopped vegetables. That's a good Then one. I can just use them as I need and they're in the freezer. They don't go off. Because before really I just bought fresh, fr fresh veg and ended up throwing three quarters of it away all the time. Do you think that that is because of time blindness predominantly? Like, you know, you know it sat there in the fridge, but it was yesterday, but actually it was three weeks ago. Do you think, is it I think that? a little bit, some of it, I buy stuff on a health kick. I buy stuff because I think, oh, I'm going to be healthy. And then I just forget about that and move mm. on to something else. I, I'm very much, I buy, I use, I, I use it then. And, and I'm just terrible at planning and making an advanced plan of future meals. So when I'm in the shop, sometimes I think I can do that. So I buy all the fresh food, think, oh, that'll you? keep me for a week. I but... don't even think that for a second. I don't think, I, I, <laughs> I've, I've kind of hacked that kind of stuff. Yeah. So for example, um, I use HelloFresh, they're not paying me, but I'd love them to. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I use HelloFresh because, and I buy, I, I book the meals that are the quickest ones. It's like 17 minutes, 20 minutes, because every single day when I've worked too long, and I suddenly realized I'm absolutely starving, hungry, and I've ignored it because I've been working. And my brain goes, do you know what? You could just get McDonald's. Yeah. You could just get delivery. Easy, and I'm it? like, no, I've got 17 minutes. And it doesn't even matter that I'm out of spoons for the day because this is going to tell me in step-by-step -step instructions. So I don't even have to think about it. So that is my hack, actually, is that I don't really do grocery shopping. I just get HelloFresh. HelloFresh is actually great. Please and this isn't me. two podcast hosts <laughs> battling for sponsorship. <laughs> <laughs> just finally, Laura, three tips, or as many as you can think of, three tips to make a successful ADHD marriage work. Be honest. So be imperfect. Show up as your mm. ridiculous self because you're only going to damage yourself and the other person if you're going to keep pretending to be something that you're not. My husband was talking about Laura Chaos boxes the other day. There were just these boxes all over our house as like, you know, a business plan from 2010 and a load of glitter and a hat. You know, it's just chaos. And actually, you know, I could try, I do try not to be chaotic, but ultimately that is who I am and there's always going to be Laura Chaos. So that's the first one. Is, is is be honest. 
And actually, I guess it's part of the same thing, actually, is you can't just say, oh, I'll be trustful because, oh, great, now I trust you. You can't do that. But you can be vulnerable. You can be open to the fact that things might go right. Mm. As much as they might go wrong, they might also go right. I honestly don't know what on earth I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, the third one is just enjoy yourselves. If you're not having a nice time, then what the hell are you even doing? That's it. That's all I've got. It's complete nonsense, but there you go. No, solid. Solid <laughs> advice. Very, very what useful. What are yours? For a successful marriage. For a relationship. You're yeah. Are you, are you married? No? Um, no, I'm not. No, but I think um, in a long-term relationship. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I'll, I'll echo what you said, really. Having fun yeah. is brilliant. Communication is so important. Yeah. I think in my past, so many arguments and miscommunications have resulted in, you know, breakups, really. And I can see how that can end up in divorce if I weren't to be married. It's how you just don't communicate the little things and then they can compound and add up and yeah, turn into huge 100%. problems where they were just communicated at, at, at source. Like, oh, that's irritated me. Or, oh, just being open and honest about what, what, what makes you happy. Stuff that makes you happy together, stuff that makes you anxious, stuff that makes you sad, and making sure you're just an open book towards because, with your because partner. Because without it, it's so easy for resentment to grow, right? Because actually, how we perceive a situation or how we show up to it is so completely different. I mean, people talk about love languages or whatever, mm. you know, and especially when we think about, like we were saying, somebody sat on the sofa scrolling in their head thinking whatever, like how that could look like, oh, right, so I've come in for the day. And you don't care. You're not going to get up and ask me how my day was or yeah. something. You know, it's the different perception of how things are or the meaning of gestures as well. You know, I don't know why this is coming into my head and I'm going to go off on tangent. Like, I can remember in a previous relationship, I was really excited. I'm a bit nerdy. I was really excited about the music video for this um, St. Vincent song. I can't even remember what it was. And I was like, watch this, watch this, it's so good, da, 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 da. And they wouldn't, they, they literally gave it like 15 seconds. And they're like, yeah, that's really good. And I was like, you. <laughs> like, you know, that's how it felt. It's like, you mm. do not love me. Like, this is important to me. I just want, you don't have three minutes for me. The betrayal. That, probably to their mind, they were like, who gives a shit? It's just some video. Yeah. Like, that doesn't mean anything. But it meant something to me. You know, and if you don't communicate these weird, weird ways that we can all see things differently, then that's how resentment grows. It's mm. because there's that miscommunication of what the, of, oh, sorry, there's an actual, actually useful tip. Do not assume, not just that how you perceive things to be are real, as we said about RSD, but also the way that you perceive something being the only way. Mm. The truth yeah. of the matter. Be open to other viewpoints. Yeah. Way, other ways of thinking. Yeah. 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 Laura, I've got a closing tradition on the podcast and I've got a feeling this is going to be an interesting one. What's the most impulsive thing you've ever done? Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. That is such a good question. We were meant to move to Ibiza. I spent years and years in Ibiza and, and I thought that that's where we were going. We, we kind of believed that was where we were going. And my husband came in and he said, you'll never guess where they want us to move. They said, we can't move to Ibiza, but we can move to Aberdeen. And I was like, go on then. Why not? I think I do feel like that. It's like, it's not just an impulsivity, but there is this kind of, I don't know. I'm a bit woo-woo and a bit fatey. And I think if an opportunity arises, then maybe there's a reason and actually, I think definitely in the sense of Aberdeen, and there's nothing wrong with with Aberdeen. Aberdeen has got a lot going for it. But as somebody who has struggled with SAD all of their life, to live somewhere that is, you know, quite dark skied for a lot of the mm. year doesn't make sense. But it has absolutely been the making of me because having chased the sun and chased the fun, ran around the world just trying to party and have fun, to actually have to to be serious and, and, and be indoors a lot of the time, it has actually done me the world of good. But, um, yeah, we'll see. I'll get back to Ruth one day, I think. <laughs> Amazing. Laura, this has been so much fun. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. And um, I look forward to having you on ADHD AF.
that HelloFresh collab is going to go really yeah, yeah, well, isn't yeah. it? And, um, and hopefully I can entice you to come to one of the shows and wave the ladle around and sing some songs with me. Sounds good. Definitely up for it. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Thank, Thank you. you.